Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perceive 2021. Please give a warm welcome to our distinguished guest, Krish Desai, a PhD candidate in physics from the University of California, Berkeley. Krish will be speaking about symmetry discovery and deep learning. Welcome to our stage. Thanks, Ian. Um, hi, everyone. As Ian said, I'm Krish Desai, and I am a PhD candidate at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, I'll be talking about symmetry discovery using deep learning, which is something I've been working on in collaboration with Ben Nachman at LVNL and Jesse Thaler at MIT. Um, the purpose of this project is to discover symmetries in datasets, in datasets of all sorts, but in particular for our interest in physical datasets. Um, the motivation for this is twofold. This is, of course, of independent theoretical interest. Every time we find a new symmetry in our datasets, it tells us something about the laws that govern our universe. But it's also of very applied and practical importance in reducing the effective dimension of large data sets. For example, if we find a siege of symmetry in high energy physics data, we've effectively doubled the size of a data set because now we can augment our data and mirror it through the siege of symmetry to have a double sized data set. Um, what is a symmetry though to begin with? A symmetry is any map G from Rn to Rn, which preserves the probability density function. Um, however, this definition of symmetry, while it might seem a bit obvious at first, is not perfectly clear in the sense that through the CDF mapping theorem, we can invert various kinds of distributions. For example, we can map the first decile to the ninth decile, the second decile to the eighth decile, and so on, and create a false symmetry of a C2 variety, for example, and we, we can create all kinds of false symmetries. And so we need to essentially tighten our definition of symmetry to eliminate this variant of false symmetry and only consider the symmetries that we genuinely believe exist. Um, a good example of this is the, is the image you see on your screen where, um, where your glass is creating distortions. And if you have a background, then you can observe the distortions. And similarly, by choosing a good reference data set and comparing symmetries that we find on our original data set to the symmetry on the reference data set, if both data sets are preserved perfectly, then we know the symmetry is the true one. But if a symmetry preserves one but distorts the other, then we know that it was a false symmetry to begin with and we should be discarding it. Um, the, the, deep, the neural net implementation that we use is a GAN-like model. However, unlike a standard GAN, there is no latent space generator. There is just a real generator. What we do is we generate real data points and then we apply a map G to it. And then we expect our discriminator to distinguish between the real data and the fake data. If the discriminator is maximally confounded, then we know that the real data looks like the fake data. Therefore, the map we applied to the real data must have been a symmetry. The loss we use is a modification of the standard binary cross-entropy loss, um, where we feed the same data to both, um, both terms of the binary cross-entropy. As we can see, the loss is maximized when P of G of X, G prime of X is the same as the original probability density. That is, even after applying the map, the probability density looks the same. And H of X, which is the auxiliary classifier, is one half, so it's maximally confounded, as we said. Now we'll try our experiment on a few examples. The first example to think about is a one-dimensional Gaussian, the simplest data set in a certain sense. And um, in this example, for example, you have the original data right here, and we have the new and now we have the symmetry data here. And what do we want our neural net to learn is the parameters E and B so that the original data and the new data overlap perfectly, that they look identical, that they cannot be distinguished. And so for this, this is the two parameter example where the neural net is expected to learn these two parameters. And indeed it does. The two parameters would be one zero and um, zero, sorry, um, zero one and one minus one. And indeed those are precisely the two parameters that analytically and numerically are learned. So since this example is extremely simple, we can actually analytically integrate the loss function and just plot out what the loss function looks like over the entire landscape. What it looks like is like this, and there are two deep wells of loss um, at zero, one, and one minus one, which is where we expect them to be, but there are also some other interesting features. The most prominent one is this steep peak right in the middle here, which tells us that you cannot traverse from the negative end to the positive end and vice versa in slope space. Um, the vertical space is slope space, the horizontal space is intercept space. Sorry. Um, so if you initialize your neural net with a positive slope, it's going to be stuck in the positive slope space. And if you initialize it with a negative slope, it's going to be stuck in the negative slope space, and you cannot go from one to the other. There is this clear loss barrier in the middle. Also noticeable in its absence is, the, is any such corresponding barrier to intercept space. Regardless of what intercept you initialize your neural net with, it'll find the correct intercept because there is no barrier in the horizontal direction, only one in the vertical direction. 
This is borne out beautifully by our neural net results, numerical results. Um, first, we observe this plot where there are two distinct clusters, one at 0, 1, and the other at 1, minus 1, which tells us there are precisely two symmetries, the identity and the negative identity, as we predicted. This plot here shows the barrier in slope space. If you start with negative slope, you end with negative slope. And if you start with positive slope, you end with, negative, with positive slope. You cannot jump from one to the other. And this one shows the absence of a barrier between slope space and intercept space, uh, between intercept space. So you can move around an intercept space freely because there is no such barrier. Um, this is more of a caveat than a genuine example because um, this, this is too simple. We know that we shouldn't be parameterizing our um, generator with b plus with one plus cx, it should be b plus cx because there are two variables here of one. But in larger dimensions, it is this could be substantially less clear. So just as a simple example to illustrate the dangers of incomplete parameterization. If you parameterize your generator incompletely, what can happen is that you can create false minima. Um, for example, there is a false symmetry at 0 0.5, um, which, which simply shouldn't be there. One plus half x is not a symmetry of the one dimensional Gaussian. Um, and so we, know, we must be extremely careful when we parameterize our neural nets to make sure that we're fully parameterizing them to be able to move over the whole space independently, because if we don't, then it's gonna get stuck in false minima. Next, we should move to the two-dimensional Gaussian. Um, the two-dimensional Gaussian, the standard two-dimensional Gaussian has every rotation as a symmetry, as you can see in this figure here, if you rotate this, it looks the same. And indeed, the analytic loss landscape reflects this. Um, the, the discriminator is maximally confounded when you lie on the unit circle, um, and you lie on the unit circle when you're rotating it, except when you're rotating it by any one of the standard relations, cos theta minus sine theta sine theta cos theta. Um, the numerics reflect this beautifully once again. Um, each of the points lies on the unit circle, and the neural net finds that every rotation is a symmetry and nothing but a rotation is a symmetry. However, if you notice, um, all transformations in two dimensions is a six dimensional group. Um, in this example, we haven't used six different parameters. We've only used two, the cosines and the sines. Um, th this is clearly an incomplete parameterization. And so what we should be doing once we have you know, established that the neural net does work well in two dimensions is move to the full six dimensional parameterization to understand the space and its entire generality. And so um, we, what we should be doing is we should be talking about the affine general linear group in particular in two dimensions now because we're working with the two dimensional Gaussian. And the affine general linear group, as I mentioned, is, is a six parameter group, which involves six different parameters, the determinant, the rotation, the shear, the stretch, and constant translations. And when you analyze this, you have to analyze this in various planes because you know you can't, you can't plot a six dimensional plot. You need to you know, take various slices. And for the 2D Gaussian, the correct symmetries would be at D equals plus minus one, theta equals zero to pi, r equals one, zero, u, a, and b are all zero. And that is indeed what we find. I've just shown you one slice here um, out of the six different possible slices, but um, all six slices, the numerics and the analytics match precisely. When you move to the, now, now let's talk about breaking the symmetry. So now we talk about a Gaussian with covariance that is not identity, it's one, zero, zero, two. This Gaussian is squished in a certain sense. It, the, no longer is every rotation a symmetry because if you rotate, you're, you're rotating this squished part as well. And now it's in a different place, it looks different. However, if you mirror it across its axis, then it still looks the same because it is squished equally in both directions, which means that if you rotate it by 180 degrees, then, um, then you obtain the exact same distribution. So you, indeed you find that rotation by nothing and rotation by 180 degrees are precisely the only two symmetries, both in the analytic and the numeric observation. Um, however, there are actually more symmetries that are, as we discussed, hidden by the incomplete parameterization. So when you parameterize the two-dimensional Gaussian that, is, have broke, that has broken symmetry completely, you find these additional symmetries which involve rotating and unsquishing essentially, or squishing in the opposite direction to reconstruct the original data distribution. So um, the original two that we found would be the zero one and the pi one that we discussed already. But there are these two additional pi over two root two and three pi over two root two symmetries that we did not discuss so far um, that are found once you do parameterize um, all six parameters of the search space. There are variations we can apply to this theme. So if we already know that there is a specific symmetry we're looking for, 
then we can add a tailored mean squared error term. For example, um, in this case, the mean squared error term displayed on the screen is the mean squared error for C2, but um, depending on which group you're interested in, you can, you can apply the mean squared error term for the specific group that you want to look for. And that will provide you with only those symmetries that conform within the group that you're looking for. So here are three examples, C2, C3, and C5, uh, C7. And in each case, the mean squared error produces only those symmetries that were being looked for if those exist. And if they don't exist, it'll only give you the identity. Um, so to wrap up, what we want to think about moving forward is working with more complicated distributions. So we've already applied this method to genuine physical data from the LAT Olympics dataset um, from the Large Hadron Collider, and the results are very interesting and um, novel. Um, the next thing we want to do is we want to generalize this to higher dimensions. So far, we've been working in few dimensions. The LAT Olympics data even is just a six-dimensional object, but um, in general, we want to work with um, things of much higher dimension, and we want to circumvent the curse of dimensionality, and we want to think more about how to do that. And finally, um, we want to think about augmenting the data with the parameters rather than learning the parameters directly, so that instead of learning the final values of the parameters, we're learning map from initialized values to final values. And we think this is one way in which we could circumvent the curse of dimensionality. Thank you. Thank you so much, Krish. It was a pleasure learning about symmetries of data sets and especially finding them with adversarial neural networks. A big round of applause from our virtual audience. We will see you at our next session.